بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا إلى الصراط المستقيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله الطاهرين وأصحابه الكاملين ما بعد فعود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وخلق الجان من مارج من نار فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان وقال تعالى قل أوحي إلي أنه استمع نفر من الجن فقالوا إنا سمعنا قرآنا عجبا يهدي إلى الرشد فآمنا به ولن نشرك بربنا أحدا وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خلقت الملائكة من نور وخلقت الجان من مارج من نار وخلق آدم مما غصف لكم Dear respected brothers, elders, sisters, youngsters, angels and any jinn that are present. And that's one thing we should understand before we even start. That in our presence all the time, there are many jinn, good and bad, that partake in many of the activities that we do. So when we come for salah, the many of the jinn will join us when you're reading Quran in the masjid, in your house. And that's our belief. So they could be sitting with us here today listening to the bayan. They might be somewhere else listening to the bayan. And this is one of the first things I wanted to mention so that we understand and subconsciously we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created two types of makhluq. Insan and and jinn. Ya yeah, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have not created mankind and the jinn, except they worship me. So their purpose in life is the same as ours. Also, before we start, I'm going to pass some slips around like we did last time. If any brothers have any questions, inshallah, just feel free to pass these around, inshallah. I think they've gone around with sisters as well. And before we conclude, inshallah, we'll take the slips back. Um, any questions related to the topic or anything throughout the bayan which wasn't clear um, I'll also mention on that note is there is a lot to go through um, so excuse any brevity or excuse anything that you don't understand and the bayan might be a bit out of order unlike last time there were three sections because like I said there's a lot to cover so looking at time I might miss certain things out so in case you're thinking why well, I'm jumping from one thing to another <coughs> The topic of jinn is a long one. Yeah, it's hard to cover in one hour. There's many things alongside with possession, the relation of black magic, etc. But inshallah, Allah willing, we'll try our best. So when it comes to the topic of unseen, things related to the unseen world, the first and foremost thing we understand is <coughs> that our belief of the unseen is mentioned in the Quran. Yeah, the ayat. Muhammad read, Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. In the first chapter, the opening of the Quran, the opening of Surah Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Alif Lam Mim, Thalik al Kitabu la rayba fi, this book in which contains no doubt, Hudalil Muttaqeen, guidance for the God fearing. Who are the God fearing? Allah Himself gives the answer in the Quran, Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. Those who brought faith on the unseen. Now what is the greatest thing from the unseen that we need to believe in? Anybody? Very good, mashallah. The first and foremost thing as a Muslim you have to believe in which you have not seen is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many other things which we believe in as Muslims and it's essential, the fundamentals of Islam. But we've not seen these things. Anything else? <coughs> Angels, very good. As a Muslim, you have to believe in angels. Imani Mufassal. What else? The? The Anbiya, very good. The Anbiya alayhim as -salam. Yeah, some people saw them. The Sahaba, Ridwan Allah, Najmain, saw the Prophet Sallallahu We haven't even seen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jannah. Anybody seen Jannah? Jahannam. Anybody seen Jahannam? Anybody seen the punishment of the grave? Anybody seen Qiyamat? It's not happened yet, has it? Angels, we've not seen. And the jinn we've not seen. So when it comes to the unseen, the first thing people think of is jinn. 
Yeah, jinn are scary, supernatural, they have strength, etc. And a lot of other beliefs, but we forget that our core fundamental belief in Islam is on the unseen. Yeah? And we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who does everything. He is the most powerful. Again, why am I mentioning these things as ground principles? Because we sometimes fear jinn more than we fear Allah. Yeah? <coughs> Somebody sees a shadow go past. This car's blocking. An Audi black FH54YH. And if you can kindly move your car, or if it's somebody from the sisters. So black Audi FH54YHN. So the first thing we need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most powerful. What do we say when we start salah? Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. And obviously over time you do this five times a day, seven times a week, it becomes robotic. And we forget that Allah is the greatest. Allah is the most powerful. Allah has control over everything. Yeah? In the verse of Sihar in the Quran, the verse of Sulaiman alayhi salam, there's a part, وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِّينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ And it's related to jinn, black magic, jadu, that they cannot harm anyone except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's very important we understand this before we even start the topic that what I'm going to talk about, there's no need to be so scared about it. Yeah? These things do exist. You hear in the papers all the time, in the news, don't we, that certain light, some form of energy was seen in the sky, or was seen in the twilight, etc. That verily could be jinn. There's no denying that that could be jinn. Yeah? These things exist, but like all things, we make it out bigger than the matter actually is. So we have to understand that these things are there, they have certain capabilities, certain strength, inshallah, which we'll go through. But we need to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most strengthful. And why I'm mentioning this is very important in the whole topic of jinn, that the more afraid a person is, the more scared, the more weak, then they're more prone to attack as well. Yeah, in many ways, in terms of Adhkar and Dua and Quran, and mentally, psychologically, if you're always going to be scared, the jinns are going to have fun with you. Whereas if we think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time, Allah says in Hadith Qutti, It's a very important Hadith. Yeah, you know a lot of people who are Tawis, and we're not against Tawis, but you know, I always say, you know, if I was to wear a Taweez, this is what I'd write in my Taweez. I am as my servant thinks of me. <coughs> and you know, sometimes to understand these short statements, it takes many years. It took me many years. Yeah, I'm not ashamed or afraid to admit that. That truly to understand this hadith, <coughs> it takes a long time sometimes. Maybe, mashallah, some of you understood it straight away. That I am as my servant thinks of me. If you think Allah is greatest, if you know Allah is more powerful, if you know Allah will always protect me, then Allah will do that. But if you have doubts, but yeah, you say Allahu Akbar and Allah is controlled, but then this jinn is pretty scary as well. He might have some strength, supernatural. He might be able to do things. <laughs> that's when your iman starts waving and shaking. And that's a sign of weak iman. That even though you say Allahu Akbar and you say a lot of things, it's just lip service. So this hadith is very important, yeah? This is part two of the first program, which is about black magic, evil. And I mentioned these things then as well. That the most important thing is mental. Mentally, your willpower, you need to understand what these things are and only Allah can cure you. So hence I'm mentioning it again. With the topic of jinn is actually more scarier for people than the other one. The other one's must just more about is it there, is it not, not there, have I got it, etc. etc. So we need to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most powerful and his words are majestic. His words are the most powerful. There is nothing more powerful than Quran. So if somebody sees something, yeah, or hears something, and they have doubts that this is from the other world, then they just need to pray Qur'an. If you have Qur'an, whether you're a Hafid of the Qur'an, or parts of the Qur'an, or half of the Qur'an, your Yaseen, your Ayatul Kursi, your Four Quls, whatever you know, it's better than nothing, isn't it? Yeah, sometimes people think that I need to get Hafid al-Qur'an, I need to do this, that. If you have fear, 
constantly you just pray the Quran because remember the Quran is just as powerful as it was when the Prophet ﷺ received it. When Wahi started in the cave of Hira, the Quran was powerful then, it's, it's powerful in the 23 years of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and it still got the same power to cure. What power am I talking about? There are many people in history, maybe some of them are alive today, I don't know anybody, but there are people who have just read Surah Fatiha once and they've cured people. Whether it's jinn, jadu, something else, even medical illnesses. Surah Fatiha once, blew on water, man drank it and he's cured. These people have existed in history. Now this was the power of the Quran. So when you recite Quran, remember, it's not the Quran is strong and weak. No. The Quran, nobody can devalue the Quran. The Quran is Quran. It's the reciter. So if I'm the reciter, if you're the reciter, it's what you've done behind the scenes. If you're praying the Hajjud with Quran, very powerful. If you're fasting with Quran, very powerful. If you're controlling your tongue from lies and slander and swearing, very powerful. If you're controlling your eyesight. But if you're not doing these things, then your Quran recitation is going to be weak. Hence, you read Ayatul Kursi before you sleep, but you still get nightmares. Because the weakness is in us. Always remember the weakness is in us. And this is very important. When you understand this, you understand a lot of umbrella topics which come under this. So like I mentioned, mentally, physically, a person needs to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most powerful. And this is sometimes why people with weak hearts, weak mentality, weak mind, they're more prone to this jinn jadu. Because like I said, the jinn will know that this brother's got this weakness, this sister's like this weakness. Or she doesn't pray much. He doesn't go to the masjid for salah. He doesn't, he doesn't do his morning and evening adhkar. He doesn't read ayatul kursi. He doesn't even stay clean in the state of wudu. Or when you need a ghusl, first ghusl, you don't have the ghusl straight away. The jinns will know and then they attack you based on this. Whereas if a person does all this, and we've seen people, they don't get attacked. Yeah, they are free from this. How to understand this? Like I said, it relates to both topics, not just jinn. Even the last topic which I mentioned, I mentioned very briefly in the last topic about reciting daily manzil, morning, evening, adhkar, listening to Quran, doing istighfar. All this builds your protection. And I'm going to add something to that to make you understand. And inshallah, if you understand this properly, you will not fear jinn, you will not fear jadu, you will not fear nazar. But it might still happen. What did I say? You might, you won't fear it. I did not say that it will never happen to you. Because... We mentioned in the last program that the Prophet ﷺ did all these things and it still affected him. Many of the Sahaba did and it still affected them. Many of the Salafi Salihin did and it still affected them. But it's about the more you do, the less affected you get. So, for example, it's cold outside, yeah? And we all have an immune system. The more healthy a person is, yeah? Has his fruit there, drinks, juice exercises regularly, looks after his body, eats less junk food or fizzy drinks, etc. His immune system will be strong. Yeah, I'm not a doctor, but we all know that. It's common sense. You learn since you're a little child that look after yourself. And when winter comes, have you noticed those children who bit of breeze and they get cold and flu? Yeah. And then there's other children who've come to the masjid today with a t-shirt on and maybe three quarter pants and he doesn't get a, a cold or flu. Why? Because his immune system is strong. So that's the first example, that those who get affected easily. And then, let's just say, everybody in this room today has a cold or flu. Yeah? Everybody's got sneezing, coughing, etc. Somebody will go home tonight and make lemsip, have a few paracetamol, and tomorrow morning, he's better. Yeah, because his immune system is good. His protection is good. He gets better very quickly and he doesn't get ill very quickly as well. It takes a lot to get him ill, but when he does get ill, he gets better very quickly. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. hey, you'll understand in a minute what I'm trying to say. And there's another brother, or let's just say, without discrimination of age, the older generation, 
who basically it takes them a week or two weeks to get better because their immune system has gone weak now. So they also had the cold and flu. Like I said, everybody in this room has got cold and flu. But it took them a week or two weeks. They have to have lemon every day and other tablets and medicine. And maybe they still don't get better or they do. Why did it take him longer? Because the immune system is weaker. Why am I talking about all this medical when you've come here to learn about jinn? It's the same with your azkar and duas. Think of it like your immune system. The more stronger your immune system, the more azkar you do. Yeah, morning, evening. There's a whole list of these things. Some of them do. Some of us do one dua, two duas. Good. I'm not saying no, but you need to increase. Yeah, you need to increase, especially like I said, if you're one of those that gets nazar very quickly, that's always worried about jinja, then you need to read about 10, 15 duas. Yeah, and then when nazar hits you or jinn tries to attack you, it doesn't bother you. Because your protection or the spiritual immune system is strong. But for those of us who, like I said, never stay in wudu, they pray the Isha now, five minutes, already broke his wudu. Yeah? Doesn't sleep with wudu. First thing in the morning, doesn't do wudu. Doesn't pray salah or doesn't pray salah in the masjid. Doesn't read morning, evening adhkars. There's other adhkars on top of that in these books like Hezbul Azam, Ma'awadat, Munajat, Maqbul. <coughs> read these books. They are very, very good. All of this is building your immune system, your spiritual immune system. Does that make sense? Yeah? Because to me, there's one thing cure that something's happened, someone's possessed, genes affect them, then we look at cure. But every single one of us should be doing this. And it's not a lot of people ask, how long, Mamana? How long? Yeah, because we're lazy all week. So you think you do it for a week and you protect it for life, you have to do it every day. The Prophet <coughs> told the Sahaba to do these things every single day and the Sahaba did it. And what sort of people were the Sahaba? 50% Iman? 75% Iman? 100% Iman and they still did it for their protection to keep their immune system strong, it's their spiritual immune system. But with us, we don't do anything and then we want to be protected. So, the first thing we need to understand is, does jinn, do they exist? And I'm sure we all know the answer to that. Like I've mentioned, it's meant there's a full surah in the Quran called Surah Jinn. Yeah? The word jinn comes from the root word jinn, noon, noon. Which means hidden. Something that's hidden. So, Jannah. It's a place that's hidden, isn't it? We've not seen it yet. Majan is shield in Arabic because a shield protects you, yeah? it hides your body. Janin is an embryo, something we can't see. And Junoon, yeah, everybody knows what Junoon is? What's Junoon? Madness. So how does that make sense? It's because when your intellect is hidden. Yeah, make it akal nayjalti, when he's Majnoon. So, the word Jannah is in the Quran as well. فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلُ رَآ كَوْكَبَ In the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that when the night cast, or the night went past, he saw the stars. When Ibrahim alayhi salam was a baby and trying to work out who Allah is, so he saw the stars and he thought, this is Allah. Then when morning came, so the word Jannah is used. فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلُ When the night was cast upon him. So, then he saw the moon and he thought this must be Allah because it's the biggest one. Then he saw the sun and he realized that none of these things are Allah because they fade away. Yeah, the sun's out in the daytime, nighttime is gone. So he realized this isn't Allah. It's a long story in the Quran, but the word I'm talking about is jinn. It's something hidden. And this is why jinn can see us, but we can't see them. Proof? Allah says in the Quran, Innahu yarakum huwa wa kabiluhu min haythu la tarawnahum. That verily. Shaitan and his army can see you in a way that you can't see them. So they are watching us all the time. Yeah? And there's a way for us to protect ourselves from this, which I'll mention later, inshallah. Because when you mention these things to people that, oh, Shaitan's always with you and he's always around you, and then what are we going to do? We've just all prayed Isha Salah, yeah? Many of you, and you don't need to put your hands up, about seven o'clock probably thought, forget the program. Because you've sat for the program, I just listen at home. Listen on the receiver, listen on Mixler. 
can't be bothered, just pray namaz at home. Happens to us on a daily basis, isn't it? That's shaitan. That's jinn. Yeah, that's a basic example I'm giving. How they're always attacking us, they're always around us. And there's many examples of this. We need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made human beings, insan, mankind, from clay. Clay, mud, whatever you want to call it, which is heavy material. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created jinn from fire, which is a bit on the light side. And heat rises, isn't it? So jinn sometimes can take different forms. Like a human body, solid structure, isn't it? Yeah? Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We created mankind in the best of structures. So if you were to compare the two, humans are always better. And there's many reasons for that, inshallah, which we'll go through. But heat rises. So jinns don't exactly have one fixed body or shape. And sometimes people like to give an example, not that I've seen it, is of the X-Men. The shapeshifters, yeah? And that's how they describe jinn. Whether you want to understand that, like I said, I've not seen it, but that's how people describe it. Maybe the young generation might understand it better. Or you can stick to what the Quran says, وَخَلَفَ الْجَانَّ مِنْ مَارِجٍ مِنْ نَارِ That Allah says that I made jinn مِنْ مَارِجٍ مِنْ نَارِ Marij, the word here, comes from maraja, which means to mix, a mixed fire. Mixed fire, a mixture of fire. وَخَلَقَ الْجَانَّ مِنْ مَارِجٍ مِنْ نَارِ So that's one explanation in the Quran. And the other ayat is, or it's in hadith as well, خُلِكَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ مِنْ نُورِ وَخُلِكَ الْجَانُّ مِنْ مَارِجٍ مِنْ نَارِ وَخُلِكَ آدَمْ مِمَّا أُوصِفَ لَكُمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the angels from light. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the jinn from fire, the mixture of fire. And خُلِكَ آدَمْ Adam al Islam of human beings from what is explained to you meaning mud and clay. <coughs> Another ayat says Minnari Samum. A description of jinn is Minnari Samum. Samum means smokeless fire. So it's not the fire that you're going to do soon on bonfire night. It's a smokeless fire. You understand? So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes jinn. Now there's one thing that many non-Muslims believe, could be Christians, could be atheists, that sometimes these things that we see, what we believe is jinn, yeah? The noise sometimes you hear in the masjid, somebody opens the door, somebody switches the lights off. I hope these things don't happen now, otherwise everyone will get scared. But it can happen in the masjid, it can happen to your ha- in your house, it can happen in the street, in the park, where you've seen something or you see a noise. Then many people who obviously are not Muslim, Hopefully Muslims don't believe this thing is a ghost or it's dead people or it's some sort of demon. Yeah, in Islam we don't believe in these things. Why? Because when a soul dies, when a person dies, his body is dead and the soul stays alive in the grave. And if you're a good person, the soul will be rewarded. And if you're a bad person, the soul will be punished. This is what we believe. The soul goes to Alam al-Barzakh. Yeah, you've all heard of this place called Barza. Okay? That's the belief as Muslims. Hence, as Muslims, we can't believe in ghosts or dead people coming alive or demons, etc. Which Halloween is coming very soon. That's one of their beliefs, isn't it? That they believe dead souls come alive or they worship the Lord of the Sun or Lord of the Dead or something. These sort of things. So Halloween is just a pagan festival and because it's in a few days I thought I'd just mention that that's why as Muslims we can't believe in these things or celebrate in these things it goes against the belief of a Muslim because it's mentioned in Hadith that your soul travels to Allah al-Barzakh and then it will be resurrected on Qiyamah and then there'll be no death after the first death there's no death so we only believe in jinn now in the Quran there's many stories of jinn Mostly related to Sulaiman alayhi salam. One ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَحُشِرَ لِسُلَيْمَانَ جُنُودُهُ مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ وَالطَّيْرِ فَهُمْ يُوزَعُونَ That for Sulaiman alayhi salam, he was able to gather the army of jinns and humans and birds. 
And there's another verse Allah says, وَالشَّيَاطِينَ كُلَّ بَنَّائِمْ وَغَوَّاسِ And this is talking about jinns or shaitan, whichever meaning you want to take. Many of them are masons who make things for Sulaiman Sulaiman and they dive in the oceans to find things. And the last verse, And there are others which are tied up. So Sulaiman sometimes used to tie these jinns up if they were mischievous, if they weren't behaving. One question arises here is that many people believe that jinns have the knowledge of the unseen. Yeah, when it comes to jinn, one of the scary things is that jinns know what's happening in another country, what's happening in India, Pakistan, who did this to me. So it's very important that if somebody says that, then they look at evidence. We need evidence. So if we look in the Quran, you'll see that in the story of Suleiman alayhi salam, فَلَمَّا خَرَّ تَبَيِّنَتِ الْجِنُّ أَلَّوْ كَانُ يَعْلَمُونَ الْغَيْبِ مَا لَبِثُوا فِي الْعَذَابِ الْمُهِينَ It's a long story which many of you will have heard the death of Suleiman alayhi salam. How did Suleiman alayhi salam die? Anybody know? Okay. Good. He was in a glass chamber and he was praying salah. Now there's a reason why he was in the glass chamber because Allah wanted the jinns to see him. Yeah? And he was leaning on his staff and he was praying salah and Allah took his soul. Yeah, this is a prophet of Allah. Suleiman alayhi salam, this is how he died. So just say this is the glass chamber and then the jinns were working for him. And for six months the jinn kept on working and thought Suleiman alayhi salam was watching because they were scared of Suleiman alayhi salam. I mentioned the verse Sometimes if they didn't work, they misbehaved and the Sulaiman used to tie them up. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted them to finish their work off. So he didn't make the death of Sulaiman very apparent. So for six months he stood on his staff and the jinn thinks that he is praying salah. What happens after six months? The jinns are still working. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends some ants. Yeah? And they started chewing at the staff. When they start chewing the staff, what happens to Sulaiman salam? He falls down because he's dead. He's passed away. And that's when the Quran says the verse. So if the jinn had knowledge of the unseen, why could they even they figure out that Sulaiman salam was in the next room had passed away six months ago? That's proof. That's Quran, yeah. So they didn't even know what happened in the next room. After that, they found out that Sulaiman had died. And there was Allah's wisdom in that. Like I said, Allah wanted the work to be finished. So this is an answer for people who say that jinns know knowledge of the unseen. What jinns can do though, like I said, they do have certain capabilities. They're not exactly like human beings. Yeah? They do a lot what we do, sleep, eat, talk, etc. They can even take the form of human beings and come into the form of a man so sometimes without your knowledge let me make that clear there's one thing because when I say this a lot of you will think possession possession is there that come later what I'm talking about is somebody who's not here yeah the Imam Sab has gone on so just say there's somebody sat there in the form of the Imam Sab which really isn't the Imam and that's a jinn. That can happen. Proof? In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when it was hijrah, yeah, when they were doing hijrah from Makkah to Medina, the Quraysh tried to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. They'd had enough. They thought, now it's just time to kill the Prophet. So what they did, they gathered all the elite of Quraysh and they were making mashwara in a house. When this mashwara was taking place, this meeting, this gathering, there was a knock on the door. A man who was unexpected came. And he claimed to be from the Najd tribe, the chieftains from the north. And he said, this is my name, this is who I am. And they believed it. And he sat in the circle and he gave, I don't want to say good mashura, because, but for them it was a good mashura. 
to kill the Prophet Sallallahu He said, best thing you do, because they were worried about blame, that if we kill Muhammad Sallallahu what will happen to us? Yeah, it's going to cause feuds and rifts between us and the Muslims. And in their hearts, they were always scared. So this man, this old man who claimed to be from Naj, one of the chieftains, he said, one person from each tribe kill him. Yeah, send one person from each tribe, however, five, six, seven tribes, and you guys together kill him. In this way, there'll be no blame. Because you've all the tribes together have killed him. Whereas if just one person goes, then that tribe will be to blame. And then this man went away. That man was shaitan. Yeah, he took the form of a human being. That's one example. The second example of how jinn and shaitan take human forms is on the day of Badr. Yeah, the Quran says, وَقَالَ لَا ظَالِمَ لَكُمُ الْيَوْمَ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَإِنِّي جَارٌ لَكُمْ There was a man called Suraqa bin Malik. And now the Quraysh were always worried about him because there was feud between his tribe and the Quraysh. So, Shaitan took the form of Suraqa. So remember, the Quraysh are fighting the Muslims in Badr, 313, the famous battle against a thousand. But before all this happened, the non-Muslims again were scared. They were fearful. So Suraka came and said, fight them. I'm with you. So they thought we've got Baku. Yeah. He's going to fight with us. His tribe will come. That's what the Quran says. وَقَالَ لَا غَالِبَ لَكُمُ الْيَوْمُ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَإِنِّي جَارٌ لَكُمْ There is nobody that can be dominant over today. And I am with you. وَإِنِّي جَارٌ لَكُمْ Don't worry. فَلَمَّا تَرَأَتِ الْفِئَتَانِ نَكَسَ عَلَىٰ أَكِبَيْ وَقَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّنْكُمْ إِنِّي أَرَى مَا لَا تَرَوْنْ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهُ And when the Muslims came, and who else came on the day of Badr? The angels! So Iblis can see the angels, can't he? So when he saw the Muslims come, when he saw the angels, he turned on his heels, the Quran says, and said, إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّنْكُمْ I don't want anything to do with you. إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهُ Even I fear Allah. Yeah, that's Quran. Shaitan said, I fear Allah, I'm not going to do what you guys are doing. Because you're going to get killed. And that's what happened. The non-Muslims lost the battle of Badr. That person who came in the form of Suraka was Shaitan. And the last example is what I mentioned in the last program. The long hadith. Um, for those who remember the story of Abu Hurairah anhu and the Sadqatul Fitr. Remember, a man came every night and said, leave me, I've got a poor family. Then he said, last time, and then the third time, he said, I'll teach you something. Let me take this, I'll teach you something. This was an actual man. So Abu Huraira believed him. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, he's a liar, but he spoke the truth, because he told you Ayatul Kursi. So even Shaitan is saying, that if you pray Ayatul Kursi at night, your house will be protected. So what more proof do we need? Yeah, how many of us read Ayatul Kursi? Once, twice, three times. Teach your children. From a young age. Yeah, I know you teach them surahs, which is very good for salah. But one of the first things you teach them is Ayatul Kursi. If you always worry, parents who always worry about their children getting attacked from jinn, jadu, nazar, teach your child Ayatul Kursi on the way to school, on the way back from school, in the morning, before he sleeps, before she eats. Anytime Ayatul Kursi can be prayed. Obviously, there's times in hadith, but the more you do it, the more protection you have. So, one thing we do learn is shaitan can take form of a human being and like I'm clarified, not possession, yeah? Because a lot of you know about possession, but not many people know this. That he could be sitting here today, hopefully he's not as one of you lot, but it's not. It's just shaitan. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi says, in his time, he noticed that many times an ustad or sheikh of his would pass away and shaitan would take that form and come back. So I'm not saying it's correct, but you understand where that belief comes from, that dead people come alive. Mm-hmm. There is something to it that this is where it comes from. This is a Muslim. This is Ibn Taymiyyah saying that he knew of his ustads and sheikhs and other people's sheikhs that would come to them and probably give misguidance. Do you get it? And then a person confused that. He died a few years ago. How come he's come back alive? But that was shaitan. And obviously, remember, the golden rule with shaitan is to misguide us and send us to Jahannam. The ultimate goal of shaitan is Jahannam. So, 
what do the jinns do that is equal to us? Like I said, many of them are Muslim and many of them are non-Muslims. They adopt the religions of human beings. So you will find Jewish jinns, Christian jinns, Hindu jinns, Sikh jinns, maybe even atheist jinns or Freemasons, if you want to call them that. Basically, they're who don't believe in Allah. So all eggs of the same basket, Freemason, atheist, devil worshippers. You get them sort of jinns as well. And we learn this through interaction with them. Yeah? Through interaction, when a person is possessed, sometimes they admit it. That I'm from this religion. Jinns lie a lot though. Yeah, so you always get a straight answer from them. Many times you have to go round and round and round and then they eventually come out with the truth. What language do jinns speak? Anybody know? Anybody learnt it? No? The jinns speak different languages. They can speak English. Arabic, Urdu, Gujarati, Punjabi, wherever they'll be, they learn that language. Again, they learn our languages. And the proof of this is something recent, as in what happened in the 60s and 70s, a famous story that went round in America, and some of you may have seen the documentary, the girl called Emily Rose, yeah, the haunting of Emily Rose. And because it was in the 60s and 70s, there are tape recordings still today that this was this a normal American girl who was speaking Latin. Yeah. And if you've seen it, you'll know that she was possessed. Eventually she died. So this is proof that jinns can speak different languages. And that's one sign of being possessed by a jinn that's all of a sudden five, six, seven year old boy or girl is speaking a language which they've never been taught and they don't know like Latin or French or German or even Arabic yeah, our children learn how to read Arabic but not necessarily learn how to speak it so this is a sign and somebody when they do get possessed we've seen many times that they do start speaking this language <laughs> not all the time most of the time the jinn will just speak English and in a normal voice as well but this is proof that Jinns also learn languages, they even worship Allah. So jinns are mukallaf. Everyone know what mukallaf means, eh? It's always a word that's hard to translate. They basically have a duty. So insan is mukallaf. Yeah, you can't do what you want. You have to worship Allah, you have to follow halal, stay away from the haram, you have to speak the truth, worship Allah, fast in Ramadan. You're mukallaf. And if you don't do this, you will go to Jahannam, that's what I mean by mukallaf. They have a duty and obligation. So jinns are also mukallaf. They will also go to Jannah if they are good. If they fast and pray salah and go for hajj, etc. And stay away from haram, they will go to Jannah. And those that don't, that get into mischief, the things we're talking about, that possess people and end up doing black magic and work with magicians. Yeah, they might even be Muslim, some of them. Just like we get Muslim human magicians and witches. In the same way, if those jinns follow shaitan and worship shaitan, they will end up in Jahannam. So, jinn are also mukallaf and they have to eat halal and do things. And you get good jinns and bad jinns. So even from the Muslim jinns, you might get jinns which are bad. Yeah, the Quran says That you get the pious one And you get the ones who are other than that So they might pray salah But they might still sin And bother people and annoy people So One person will ask that How do we protect ourselves And one protection Which is a general rule And it's a very simple protection Is Bismillah For Everything me starting my bayan today, say bismillah. You want to sit, say bismillah. You want to eat, say bismillah. You're closing your door, say bismillah. You're changing your clothes, say bismillah because they watch you. Yeah? When you go in the toilet, what's the dua we pray? Bismillah, Allahumma. Inni a'udhu bika min al khubuti wal khaba'id. Because the khubut and khaba'id are the shayateen. The jinn even eat and drink. How do we know they eat and drink? 
Now it's time for you to provide the evidence. I've talked enough. It's easy. I just gave half the answer before. Go on. If you if like if they like possess someone, yeah, then like they they gonna eat. Okay. How do you know though they eat? How do we know? You'll know it. Even the little boys will know because the mother said you taught this. Mashallah. If you say Bismillah, and the Hadith says if you don't say Bismillah, Shaitan eats with us. Everybody knows this, isn't that's basic proof? You all know it. That's the proof that Shaitan eats. That if you say Bismillah, Shaitan says goodbye. Can't eat with him. But there's a famous Hadith, isn't it? That the Sahabi was eating, 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 and the Prophet ﷺ was watching him, and then he remembered that he didn't say Bismillah, so he said Bismillah. Awwalahu. And Shaitan, what did he do? Vomited. He vomited what he had eaten because the Prophet is no longer halal for him. And the Prophet smiled. And then he explained it to the Sahabi that this is why I was watching. Shaitan was eating you. When you said Bismillah, awwalahu wa akhirahu. So that proves that Shaitan and jinns eat and drink. Now, one thing we have to remember is Adam alayhi salam. When he was created, we all know the story. Iblis was told to bow down. Yeah? And this was out of respect. He wasn't worshipped. Yeah? The sun, the moon, the angels, everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told to bow down to Adam alayhi salam out of respect and to show superiority. I mentioned earlier that if it comes to jinn and insan, insan is better because we have the intellect. Angels also have intellect and jinn also have intellect. Yeah? Anything that questions has intellect. Yeah, this is one rule to remember. So angels even question. Remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was creating us and the angel said, Atajalu fiha ma yufsidu fiha wa yisfiku dima. So why are you going to create people that's going to cause mischief and shed blood? They questioned Allah. Yeah? So that's proof they have intellect. Jinns also have intellect. And humans, alhamdulillah, we hopefully all have intellect. So, when it comes to Adam alayhi salam, Iblis has had that jealousy since that time, that hatred for our great great grandfather Adam alayhi salam, and since then he's hated all of us because he said in the Quran, "Tumma la atiyannahum min bain aydihim wa min khalfihim wa an aymanihim wa an shama'ilihim." That I will come from in front of them and behind them and on their right hand side and their left hand side to make them astray. You've sent me to Jahannam, watch, I'll make all your children astray and lead them to Jahannam. And in the end, what did he, what did he say? He told Allah that most your slaves will not be grateful. There, that you'll have mercy upon them, you'll feed them sustenance, you'll give them clothes, you'll give them wealth, knowledge, everything. In the end, they're still going to disobey you. Yeah? And in another verse, Allah says, إِلَّا Except for my sincere servants. So this is proof that shaitan's main goal and the jealousy he's had from day one. But remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us more intellectual power and more aql than jinn as well. Yeah? So why am I saying this is because many people think, oh, jinn can take forms and fly and they've got strength. That is there. But it's always brains over brains. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the power. This is why I mentioned about the Quran and the recitation and the azkar. You do that, then you're protected and there's nothing to worry about. Because Iblis and his progeny, you could say, have always had this inferiority complex against human beings. Yeah? If that's the psychological way you want to think about it, they've always felt they're lower. Mm. Yeah? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, that the insan is the best of mankind. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ مِنْ سُورِ تِينَ That I've created mankind in the best of structures. Not animal, not cattle, not bird, not fish, not jinn. <coughs> didn't say لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْجِنْ So always remember this, that despite all the powers they have, we are still better and more powerful. And this is why I'm trying to set your mind mentally, that you don't fear jinn. I don't even like using the word jinn. I usually refer them as shaitan. Because when you pray, say shaitan, it plays it down a bit. Yeah? If I told you there were 50 shaitans in this room, nobody would be scared. But when you say there's 50 jinn, everybody runs away. Same thing. Shaitan is jinn, jinn is shaitan. <laughs> you understand? 
So what can Iblis do to us? What can Shaitan and his army do to us? Can they have an effect on us? Can they influence us? Can they misguide us? Yes. Now there's many different types of jinn. We're not going to go through all of them because time doesn't permit that. One type is mentioned in Surah Nas. Min sharril waswasil khannas. Khannas is the one who whispers evil. And that's why in this surah, you're seeking protection from khannas. Qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas. We start with the refuge. Another one is called khanzab. Khanzab is the one that gives doubt. In salah, in wudu. Yeah, how many of you prayed salah today? And then when you're praying, you witter and thought. Have I prayed two or three? Did I pray dua in or did I just go in ruku? Wudu, did I wash my elbow or not? And many people experience this. Yeah, they do wudu again and again and again. Before you know it, they made a little puddle in the wudu kana. Yeah, or they've done wudu so much, they've done wudu for the next guy as well. Because they keep repeating it, repeat, repeat, repeat. And the same happens in ghusl. Some people spend hours and hours and hours doing ghusl. Keep on pouring water over themselves because they think, oh, I miss my neck, I miss my head, I miss this. That is the shaitan called khanza. So there's many shaitans that come to us in different forms and do different things. Again, it's not something to worry about. I'm only explaining because if you're one of those people that has doubts and waswasa, then you know that there's a shaitan fix. That's his job, daytime job. That's all he does. Yeah? When we go to sleep, who knows the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu What happens when we go to sleep? What does shaitan do? Very good. He ties three knots. Everybody's heard, heard this hadith, yeah? Shaitan comes to you. So this is every night, yeah? Whether you pray tahajjud, fajr, or you don't pray. This happens to every single Muslim. Yeah? So in case you think I'm free from jinn, free from shaitan. No, they're coming to everybody. Even the imam of the masjid, whoever you are. Yeah? Every person has three knots tied upon him. And the first one, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that if a person, he doesn't wake up for Fajr, then the angels say to him, Nam laylan tawilan, sleep, you've got a long night. But when he wakes up and he remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فذكر Allah. ذكر Allah could mean the dua for waking up, which is? Alhamdulillah, So that's one dhakar Allah. Yeah? It doesn't say the exact um, dua, but any form of remembrance. A person just say Qarat and said Bismillah. That's dhakar Allah. One knot is untied. The second knot is untied when? When he does wudu. So if he wakes up, that's why like, if he just wake up, wake up and stay in bed, then there's only one knot untied. He didn't pray for Jesus, then go do wudu. Number two is when he does wudu, the second knot is untied. Now one thing I'm going to mention here, um, as a side note, is the Prophet ﷺ mentions in hadith, فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانِ يَبِيتُ فِي خَيْشُونِهِ That shaitan sits, or you could say spends the night on the end of his nose. This is for everybody. Yeah? Shaitan spends the night. Now whether he sleeps or he's awake, I don't know. But he spends the night at the end of your nose. So when you do wudu, you should rinse your nose properly. Because shaitan's been there. Shaitan's dirty, he's impure, he's nafaq. Yeah, this is hadith. It's not made up things. And I'm giving you reality of how much interaction and involvement shaitan and jinn have with us on a daily basis and you just don't know and you don't see it. But those people, mashallah, who pray Fajr, Fajr is protection in hadith. Those people who do wudu, who pray the five times salah with jamaat, sisters who cover up, brothers who follow the sunnah, all this is protection. And that's what I'm saying, you don't need to worry about it. If somebody doesn't de- do these things, I mean, he just needs to stop. He doesn't need to worry as well. So that's the second knot. And the third knot is untied when? When he prays Fajr Salah. So if somebody wakes up, remembers Allah, alhamdulillah, does his wudu and prays his fajr, and then is free from that, from the influence of shaitan. Now many times we don't help ourselves with some of the things we say. Sometimes a person can say things and it actually helps shaitan, and shaitan gets very arrogant and gets very big. In easier terms, it's like you've empowered shaitan. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal narrates in a hadith that a Sahabi 
radiallahu anhu was traveling with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi behind him and the Prophet sallallahu camel tripped so this sahabi said ta'isa shaytan which means may iblis be cursed shaytan be cursed so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi said by you saying that iblis has now become very big like a house yeah you've made him arrogant what you should have said is bismillah yeah anything happens wrong something slips out your hand and this one for mothers and sisters as well that sometimes you cook in something something spills or you drop something and many of us say <coughs> if not curse shaitan we might say some swear words or shaitan did it yeah oil spilled your vegetables fell down your shopping dropped and what do we say shaitan nikia yeah, that's incorrect, especially in our Asian culture, it's very common. What you should say is Bismillah. If you can't say Bismillah, any form of remembrance, blame yourself, say Astaghfirullah. Yeah? Because the Prophet mentioned in this hadith, if you say Bismillah, then shaitan gets very small like an ant because he's caused it, he's done something, but you've not made it worse. By you cursing him, it's you've just made the situation worse. So this is one thing I thought I'd mention. Now, there's a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, about shaitan traveling in the body. Yeah? That shaitan sometimes can flow in the body like blood. Do you believe it? Yeah? Sounds difficult, doesn't it? But it's true. Sahih Muslim, inna shaitana yajri min al insani majrad dam. That shaitan flows in the human body just like blood. So that's how much he can travel around your body. And this is how much of an influence. So these things show us shaitan can have an influence on a person's life, on his ibadat, on his iman. Now the next topic is an interesting one which often people ask is the topic of jinns getting information from the malaika, from the angels. So people who hopefully nobody sitting here, brothers or sisters, or anybody listening at home does this. People who go to fortune tellers, soothsayers, yeah, these people, these gypsies, if you want to call them that, and they have a crystal ball or the cards and things, and then they read and say that you will get married to this person, he's going to be rich or she's going to be beautiful, and you're going to have this many kids. Is it true? Mm-hmm. Yeah? And at the same time, I'll also talk about people, because I know. Back home, it happens a lot in India, Pakistan, people who look at stars and things, yeah? Um, the same things that come in the uh, paper, the Aries, the Cancer, etc., your star signs. For any youngsters who follow that or read that, that is against Islam. Because none of this is true. Yeah, sometimes as kids, you might just do it for a laugh. But let's see what's going to happen to me this month. It's totally wrong, yeah? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever believes in that or goes to these people, فَقَدْ kafara that he has disobeyed the Prophet mm-hmm. So, what is the truth about this? And shooting stars comes into this as well, yeah? We've all heard of shooting stars. Is it true? Is it an alien? Is it UFOs? What are they? So before the Prophet Wasallam's time, jinns used to go to the heavens. And they used to listen to the angels. And the angels were talking, and they will be talking about passing books over. He's going to die. She's going to die. He's going to get married. This is... Earthquake's going to happen, this guy's going to receive misfortune, he's going to have a car accident, etc, etc. They would pick up that information, yeah? And they'd come back and people that worship the jinns, shaitan, these fortune tellers and these cards, etc. They would give them that information, whatever they've received. But they wouldn't receive much, they'd get a bit, they'd add lies to it and mix it, a bit like the tabloid newspapers, and then they sell the story. Does that make sense? So these people you see, I don't know if there's any Blackburn, but this is what they've done essentially. So why I'm saying this is because sometimes even Muslims who fall prey to them then say that, but he said that one thing and it happened. That my son's going to have a car accident and it happened. And he said my daughter will get married next month and it happened. So that's the one. But the 99 lies, what about all that? So this is where they get it from. That Before the Prophet's time, Sulaiman salam in his time controlled the jinns. After that, he passed away. They were free roaming around. So they would hit the heavens and they would listen to certain things, one or two bits of information about this brother, this brother, mix it with lies, sell it to these people. Then, 
When the Prophet ﷺ received his risala, the Quran says, وَأَنَّا كُنَّا نَقْعُدُ مِنْهَا مَقَاعِدَ That they used to sit and listen to the angel. فَمَنْ يَسْتَمِعِ الْعَانِ يَجِدْ لَهُ شِهَابَ الرَّصَدَ That after the Prophet ﷺ received his risala and prophethood, we won't say they don't go. It's become very difficult for them. And that's why the shooting stars. The shooting stars, or sometimes a comet, or sometimes fire. Um, angels will throw different things at them, and that's what sometimes you, sh- you see in the skies. But that's true. Yeah? And that's mentioned in the Quran. <laughs> He'll find these things. So if somebody says that, can the jinn still pick up this information now? Yes, but with difficulty. Before the time of the Prophet, it was very difficult. Now, in the time of the Prophet, were there any jinns that accepted Islam? Were there any jinn that we called Sahaba? Were there any Sahaba who basically knew of jinns? So the answer to that is once the Prophet ﷺ was leading Fajr Salah in Mecca. And it wasn't exactly in Mecca because they weren't allowed to lead in the Haram. So it was in a valley outside of Mecca. And he was reciting Surah Ahqaf. In the, for the 46th Surah. And then some jinns came in the valley to listen to the Quran. And when they listened, they were astonished. And they liked what they heard. Now these jinns were Jewish jinns. At that time, they were on the religion of Musa salam. So it's mentioned that nine jinns accepted Islam just by listening to the Prophet recitation and his Fajr Salah. And these were the first of the Sahaba jinns because they saw the Prophet accepted Islam on his hands and they died on Iman. And after that, they went back to their tribes and many jinns accepted Islam. Ibn Hajar, Hafiz Ibn Hajar, Rahmatullahi says that sometimes up to 70,000 jinns would visit the Prophet ﷺ. That many multitude had accepted Islam. So there were many jinns, just like many Sahaba had also accepted Islam, many jinns. And there's a narration in Tirmidhi. Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu once he narrates that the Prophet ﷺ took him into an open field and then he drew a circle on the ground and he told Abdullah ibn Masood that sit in this circle until I come back. Abdullah ibn Masood says, I sat for a very long time and the Prophet ﷺ went very far away and from the heavens I could see tall large creatures coming from the skies and the Prophet ﷺ was talking to them for a very long time. And then when he came back, I asked him, Ya Rasulullah, who were these people? And he said, these were the jinns. And they came to me to visit me to complain about the ummah. That tell your sahaba that don't use bones. That the sahaba were using the bones for other things. Sometimes they'd use them for wiping things. Obviously, this is back in the days when they have towels and tissues and accessories. After eating, they might use it to wipe their hands. They might use it for other things. So... One thing we learn from this hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ used to engage with the jinns, he would talk to them. The second thing we learn is that the food of jinns is Dixie. Yeah, not Dixie, just the bones of Dixie. Bones. So we learn from this hadith that they said leave the bones because that's our sustenance. So not making it too scary, but sometimes if you see an animal, yeah, because jinns can take forms of animals. Snakes and dogs are very common, the most common. And other animals too, even cats, but not the superstitious thing about black cats, any cat. Brown cat, white cat, ginger cat, there's no specific, because I don't want to make the superstitious thing that black cat thing, that's all baseless. But, the common form they take in animals is snakes and dogs. Yeah? So like if you see sometimes a particular animal is after a bone, then no, that might be a jinn. Same with cats. Yeah? Cats have food, dogs have food which they eat. That would be a normal cat and dog. But if they specifically want bones, then we can say that might be a jinn. And when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, he was actually ordered to kill all dogs because of this. That all dogs are shaitan and jinn. And then the order, the command lessened and it came just to black dogs. 
So that, that generally shaitan, jinn take the form of black dogs. That doesn't mean again every black dog. Yeah? Sometimes things are mentioned in hadith, it doesn't mean every single person. So like in the Quran, it talks about al-Yahud, it talks about al-Nasara, yeah? But it doesn't mean all the Jews and Christians. It could be talking about specific time of Jews. They had these traits. Specific Christians were like this. So same with this about black dogs. Now it comes on to where do jinns live? Yeah, do they have houses? Do they have mortgages and rent? I don't know about that. But they tend to live in places of water. Where there's a lot of water. Trees. And again, it's not every tree. So don't go knocking every tree down thinking, I'm going to kill all the jinns. And sometimes caves and mountains. This is what we know. Yeah? Now, if there's a jinn living in this masjid or in your house, that could be true. This is a general room. Caves, water, trees. They live in these places. And like I said, you should know that they come for salah, they pray in the masjid. Um, Regular when you go for Jama'at, you get told that at night time don't disturb them because they pray at that time. When you go to the toilet, take somebody. This is why, because they're doing ibadah and you disturb them, then they might disturb you. Now it comes on to one of the most important questions, and many of you sitting here probably just came to the talk to know this, is that can jinns enter your body? And if they can, how? Can they enter anybody's body? Yeah, so 50 jinns came today and there's about 50 of us sitting here and they just entered. Is that possible? The most common reasons why jinn enter people's body, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, yeah? General rule, they can't enter non-Muslims as well. Like I mentioned the story of Emily Rose, she was non-Muslim. <coughs> Number one can be there's jadu behind it. Somebody's done jadu on person X and this person X got possessed because he's been fed jadu. So jadu gives that person, gives the jinn permission to enter. Yeah? And like I said, back to the law immune system example, the protections law. And number two is just that. So there's no jadu, there's no black magic. So this is for all of us. So if somebody thinks, nobody's doing black magic, I'm here, man loves me, I'm everyone's friend, people's person then this one's for you, is that anybody can affect it. If they're low on their adhkar and their du'as, etc., and sometimes you end up in a wrong place, the park, under the tree, back alley, and you're not back, women on the menstrual cycle, more prone to get attacked. Like I said, a man needs ghusl and he doesn't do ghusl, goes to work, and obviously doesn't play namaz and stuff. And then he ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time, then jinns could possess him. If they don't possess him, they might affect him and bother him. Yeah, it's not always about possession. That there's jinn around your ill gil bothering you, what's what's etc. So one thing we know is that these jinns that do that are not good jinns. They can't be from the pious ones, yeah? <coughs> that doesn't mean they're not Muslim. They can be Muslim but evil Muslims, just like you get evil human beings which are Muslim as well. And how do they do it goes back to what I said in the last program. The black magic and things they use, the hair, the pubic hair, the blood, the nails, urine, things in the grave, menstrual cycle, blood, these sort of things. And a person can get affected. But like I said, even if a person is affected, it doesn't mean it's affected, possessed for life. We've seen, yeah, even Christians and Jews believe in the exorcism. Yeah? It's many of the Christian books says that. Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, used to um, remove demons, jinns from the body. So they also believe in it, it happens to them. Um, many times they come to Muslims as well, for ilaj, taweez, rukhi, etc. Hindus, Christians do that regularly. Um, what can you do then? If a person's affected, or he's not affected and wants to protect himself, there's many things you can do first and foremost, like I said, the most powerful thing which... Hazrat Iblis taught us himself was Ayatul Kursi. Yeah? If Hazrat mentioned it, then you need to do it. Yeah? If Hazrat mentioned Ayatul Kursi is going to protect you from Shaitan and his friends, then we need to do Ayatul Kursi. And like I said, there's times for it. Morning, evening, after Salah. Hadith of the Prophet Whoever reads Ayatul Kursi after Salah, there's nothing to stop him going into Jannah except death. That's it. Three, four seconds it takes. Yeah, young generation will read it even faster. 
doesn't even take a minute. So if you died, you prayed Isha Salah now, you prayed Ayatul Kursi and you died tonight, guaranteed you are going. Anybody have a doubt? Hadith from the Prophet Yeah, There's no doubt in it. So Ayatul Kursi is one. Number two is the three kuns. Yeah, Surah Ikhlas, Surah Falak, Surah Nas. Pray them three times after Fajr and Asr. You can also, one narration mentions, cup your hands like this, yeah? Put your hands together like in dua. For people who can't see listening at home and sisters, you cup your hands, blow into it, and then pass your hands all over your body. You can do the same thing before you sleep. This is all protection. The first ruku of Surah Baqarah. So the ruku which Muhammad recited at the start, that ruku from um, Alif Lam Mim, Till the first ruku and then the last ruku from Amun al Rasul till the end. Ideally, if somebody does the full Surah Baqarah, daily basis, <coughs> weekly basis, fantastic. Yeah, somebody who does the full Surah Baqarah over two, three days or over a week, even every week, he completes Surah Baqarah into seven portions. He splits it because it's the longest Surah in the Quran. Very good. You'll be protected for those of us who can't. Try and memorize the first ruku, last ruku. It's very easy. Then, the hadith of the Prophet. <laughs> Whichever house Surah Baqarah is recited in, the hadith says recited in. The hadith does not say YouTubed in, yeah? Because there was no YouTube in that time. It's recited in, will be protected from shaitan and jinn. Yeah, now many people say that we play Surah Baqarah on YouTube. It's not haram to do it, it's not even makroo. It's good as a last resort. Yeah? The effect is not the same. What's the proof? The effect's not the same. Then just listen to salah at home as well then. Yeah? You know, if, if for those of us who don't know du'as, <coughs> this is another thing in our community. We need to learn du'as by heart. Yeah, you learn everything by heart. People know so many websites by heart. People know so many account names on Facebook and Instagram by heart. People know so many account numbers by heart. When it comes to du'a, Malana, I don't know Arabic. I don't know Arabic, then how do you pray Surah Fatiha? How do you pray the last 10 surahs of the Quran? You need to learn du'as. Yeah, it's not the same praying du'as on YouTube and saying, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. It's not the same. It's the same with Surah Baqarah. You need to pray it because a lot of people say, I pray Surah Baqarah in my house every day, but I'm still bothered. Okay, it's good. Like I said, I'm not going to put anyone off. If someone's doing it, carry on doing it, but you need to recite. Yeah? How about tomorrow for Fajr, yeah? Give the mods in a day off, but we'll just play it on YouTube. The azan. Put the azan on YouTube. Same thing, we'll get Medina Sharif on. Yeah? So you can't just do YouTube. It's a very minimum and last resort for someone maybe who doesn't have tajweed or can't recite Quran, somebody who's got difficulty, etc. Adhan helps. Adhan helps as protection and it's a form of cure because shaitan runs away from Adhan. Things like manzil. Manzil is very powerful. Surahs in the Quran which are protected from jinn jadu. Recite it every day. Um, olive oil. Uh, jinns hate olive oil. Obviously it's from the sunnah. It's mentioned in the Quran. And very powerful. Again with manzil. Um, what I like to say. Even if somebody does Surah Baqarah. Or first and last ruku of Surah Baqarah. You can pray manzil. And blow onto olive oil. Dumb, what we call dumb, yeah, in our, in our terms. You can blow onto water, keep a jug or bottle of water, blow onto it, give it to your children every day. For those who don't wish to attend or go to anybody, they can do these things. Sisters who cook can pray manzil, blow on food, etc, etc. Morning, evening du'as, which I mentioned. So not just one. Yeah, if someone does one, it's a stop. There's six, seven, eight du'as you need to increase, yeah? The Bismillah, illa lila, iduru ma'asimi shayin, fulazi wa laqis sama, a'udhu bi kalimati illa itam, these sort of du'as, yeah? And you can get them online. And the last one is Qur'an, general Qur'an. As much as Qur'an you can recite, your immune system will be boosted. And there's du'as like, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min hamazat al-shayateen wa an yahdurun. The dua for the toilet, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubuthi wa al-khaba'ith. These sort of du'as protect you. On that note, there's many du'as in the sunnah. So you know these du'as your kids read, whether it's called 40 daily prayers, 40 masnoon prayers, du'as in child's gift, etc. Yeah? Our kids learn them, but many parents don't know them. Sometimes the ustad doesn't even know them. Yeah? So we need to learn these du'as. Some of them, the ones you recite on a daily basis, this is protection. Yeah, protections, not just Ayatul Kursi, Manzil, morning, evening, du'as. 
Bismillah wa barakatillah, yeah? After eating, drinking, bismillah. When you change your clothes, say bismillah. Entering toilet, leaving toilet, entering masjid, leaving masjid, drinking milk, eating at somebody's house. All these duas are sunnah. You get rewarded for them and they are part of the protection. So it's very, very important you learn these duas. Sometimes we belittle these duas and think it's petty. It's like, what's the name of that? Lamba wazifa. What do we want? Lamba wazifa. Lambi tasbi. And the Mali sub has to have a big beard as well. Lambi dari. That's cure. That's cure. Because that's the mentality people have. When you give people manzil, they laugh at you. Choti kitab, five minutes. What's that going to do? What I said earlier, the Qur'an is as powerful as it was on the day of Badr. It's still as powerful. It's on the reciter. So some people, that's all they recite and they get protected. And some people, unfortunately, because they don't recite. And another thing which I forgot to mention in the list of things for protection is reg- uh, not regular wudu, but staying in wudu. Obviously you have to do wudu for salah and the Qur'an, etc. But keep your wudu. Yeah? Some people have this habit of breaking wudu after salah, after Qur'an. Meaning after their matlab's finished, with wudu finished, yeah? It shouldn't be like that. Try and keep your wudu till the next salah. Like obviously not from Isha till Fajr, but when you prayed Maghrib, try and keep your wudu till Isha. It's winter time, times are short. Beshak after Isha, let your wudu go. But try and stay in wudu because it's a state of purity, yeah? To the extent some people even say that at night, yeah, Obviously, people are tired, people are lazy, etc. You've got work the next day, you can't be bothered doing wudu. Yeah? Winter time generally is hard doing wudu because it's cold. So, some ulama even say that just do tayammum. And on your wall, tayammum is normal when you don't have water. So, obviously, you can't do anything with that. But as a form of protection, just slap your hands on the wall, on your face, on your arms, is better than nothing. Or somebody wakes up in the middle of the night. Yeah, they go to toilet like some people tend to do, and then you can't bother doing wudu because it's two a.m., three a.m. It's two a.m. But to that extent, that's how much ulama talk about staying pure and clean, and it's very, very important. Now, finishing off, we'll collect in any questions just so I understand time-wise. Um, if there's any questions from the sisters, uh, please pass them through, and any brothers, I can see some that have written questions out. If you want to send them to the front, inshallah. I'll be concluding in the next five minutes. So, the things I mentioned about protection, most I've covered. Another one which is often asked, I've got some questions myself, meaning some questions that came in my head, so I'm, I'll do them before the Q&A, or what people tend to ask. So one is this understanding that at Maghrib time, yeah, people believe that uh, shaitan and jinn spread out, bring your kids in. Is it true? Or is it old mother's tales? Is it hearsay? It's a hadith of the Prophet Yeah, It's authentic and it's true. That in Maghrib time, the shayateen spread out. So bring your children in because children are vulnerable and more prone to attack. So bring them in, close your windows. And what do you say when you close your windows? Bismillah. That's protection. Yeah? Close your doors. Bismillah. When you say Bismillah, shaitan says to his boys, Sorry, we can't enter this house. It's as simple as that, like I mentioned about the food. So, another thing which some people are not sure about and they ask is at night, yeah, many of our elders cover pots and vessels and glasses which have water or oil or food, etc. Yeah? Is it just to protect it from the mice and rats or is there another reason that we cover things up? <coughs> it's hadith of the Prophet <laughs> and it's in this hadith, the Maghrib hadith, that bring your children in, close the doors and windows and cover your pots and vessels. So that's authentic, yeah? It's just not what your grandma said and it's come from India, Pakistan. And once you do these things, shaitan will not have access. Again, when you cover it, say, how I said the rule earlier about Bismillah is just a general rule for everything. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, كُلُّ أَمْرٍ ذِي بَارٍ لَمْ يُبْدَأْ بِبِسْمِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ أَقْدَأْ yeah? Every great honourable thing you do, meaning anything good you do, yeah? obviously you're not going to do a sin and say Bismillah. Yeah? Someone drinks alcohol and says Bismillah. Maybe somebody takes a cigarette and says Bismillah. So, any good thing you do, yeah, you should say Bismillah. That's hadith. 
Yeah, and there's stories of people, every action they did open the door, make chapatis, comb her hair, and she used to say bismillah, there's many virtues of that. So that's a general rule. The other times we should say is when husband and wife meet and have a relationship, yeah, before obviously engaging in that, before taking your clothes off, say bismillah, there's a dua, Allahumma jannim la shaitan wa jannib shaitan ma razaqtana. Yeah, that's a dua. So then whatever Allah blesses you, if a child is born, you'll be protected from shaitan. So all of these things we should be doing. I mentioned about changing clothes, closing doors, windows. And another common question which related to jinns is the topic of aliens, UFOs and these sort of things. Yeah? I've asked many people this answer myself because people ask me, I'm not interested. Like really, there might be aliens, Mars, whatever. But because the young generation tend to ask and they're adamant like, on knowing, the general answer is not a yes, no. It's, there's no aliens mentioned in the Quran. There's nothing specific in Hadith. But as a general rule, Allah says in the Quran, مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ That Allah will create things that which you, have not, you don't have knowledge of. Yeah? And this was in the time of Prophet ﷺ, which we can interpret as planes, yeah, in the time of the process of camels and donkeys and horses. Now you've got planes, trains, cars, social media, internet, computers, cars, all of these things, etc. So, answering the question is that it's very possible Allah also created other species. Another verse is وَلَكَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقَ تَفْدِيلًا That Allah says, we have honored the children of Adam. وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ And we have taken them in the sea and land. وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ And we have given them pure sustenance. وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْدِيلًا And we have given them preference, honor and virtue. أَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا Upon our many other creations. Yeah? This is what the Quran says. So the Quran didn't say here that we're the best. It said that we've given you preference over others. Upon other creation. So some ulama say this could indicate towards jinn, towards fish, towards cattle, towards birds, or something along the lines of the alien or whatever. Yeah? Somebody who's really interested in this or wants to study more, there's an article by a non-Muslim called John Hoover and Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al Ibn Taymiyyah has written articles about this as well so John Hoover has commented on this article I'm pretty sure you can find it online it's called The Perpetuity of Creation and the Thought of Ibn Taymiyyah somebody who's very much into alien spaceships and UFOs you can search this article for more and this is why I said it's never a yes, no answer, it's a possibility. Yeah, it's a possibility. We don't say yes, we don't say no. And the final thing from my own questions is, many people ask about um, something they hear about a qareen or shaitan that's with you all the time. Is this true? Is there somebody with us all the time? So, you know how I mentioned earlier about khannas and khanzab and they come to you, wudu time, salah time, and they come um, other times. Khannas whispers evil things, makes you do sin and evil. That's come and go, yeah? Come and go. And then the tying the knots is every night. But this qareen is fixed for each one of us. And it's true, it's in authentic hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, when a child is born, fixed with him is a shaitan. And this shaitan's job is to misguide us. So it's with you all the time. Again, I don't want anybody to worry and start overthinking and go in paranoia mode that what's going to happen to me, the shaitan's always with me, with me. Or there's other people who then justify their sins. Kya kare? Shaitan made me do it. Makareen made me do it. Yeah. Someone drinks alcohol, someone fornicates, someone watches TV, listens to music. Shaitan, kareen thana, usne kare. No, that's wrong. Because your kareen is there, but what did I keep on saying throughout the program is even jinn can't do anything to you if you mentally are strong and powerful and you're doing what you need to do. Your kareen will be under control. And that is the way. I don't want to go into too much about kareen. It's a long topic. But in terms of 
those who worry about it, who have heard about it and they're not sure what to do, the solution is the same. What I said again and again, do your adhkar, your manzil, surah baqarah, keep protected, keep your immune system flowing and boosted. Inshallah, your kareem will harm you. And when you slip and fall, maybe he'll make you end up doing the sin. You just do tawbah. You don't need to worry about kareem too much. It's just obviously a lot of these things which I mentioned towards the end is hearsay and people sometimes fob it off and say it's not true. But these are authentic hadith. So inshallah, we'll start with the questions from <coughs> the brothers. Anybody got any questions? No? Where was the article called? The article by John Hoover is called The Perpetuity of Creation and the Thought of Ibn Taymiyyah. If you want to write it down, or anybody listening at home wants to write it down. Okay, the, the sister's questions are coming. Um, I think that's more or less, alhamdulillah, everything covered. I did plan to finish by 9 o'clock, so that's fine. Anybody got any questions they want to ask? Not write down. G. Uh, empty properties, how do you prevent jinns from taking over? Okay. Empty property or occupied, the solution is the same. Pray Surah Baqarah, go there and pray Manzil, first and last of Surah Baqarah if you can't recite it all. Or break it into bits, half a sifara a day, over a week, finish it off inshallah. Yeah. Anybody else from the brothers with questions? Okay, a few questions. Ji. The story of the jinn and the angels, is that is that part of our faith? And, and yeah. So what I said about them listening? Uh, no, uh, so prior to humankind, that jin, uh, the jinns were on the earth and that they caused havoc and is that, is that? Yeah, they did. The jinns were created before humans, and the proof of that is, is Iblis himself is a jinn, mm -hmm. Shaitan. And obviously, we all know the story of Iblis. So, in his good days, mm -hmm. yeah, he had like other names one name's Harith, one name's Azazil, these sort of names. And by the way, don't anybody think that changes sense. Harith is still a good name, even though Iblis had that name. Harith is a good name mentioned in Hadith as well. So, what they used to do, they did used to cause chaos, mischief and um, the, they would have caused problems to the angels after that insan was created Adam salam, and then there was that constant jealousy okay. Yeah. okay there's a few questions on here is it true that we should also avoid going out at zawal time kids playing okay zawal is not mentioned in the hadith like i said what's mentioned in the hadith is maghrib time if there's a hadith on zawal i'm not aware of it and Zawal time, I can understand why this person asked this question. Sun rise, Zawal midday, when the sun reaches its zenith, and the sun set. These three times, Shaitan is worshipped. Yeah, Shaitan is worshipped. So, there's no prohibition in the hadith to refrain from going out. If somebody wanted to do it for their own thing, that Shaitan's been worshipped, whatever, you can. But the main in hadith is Maghrib. On that note, something I forgot to mention is that there are certain times of the year when, again, you could be more prone to attack, get attacked by jinn and people who are already having issues with jinn, who are possessed or even if it's just jadu, um, they feel their symptoms more. What I'm talking about is times of the year is Halloween as well. Halloween, sometimes Christmas. Sometimes Hindu festivals, I'm not sure of the names, but there's certain Hindu festivals which I'm pretty sure come around this time of the year, end of October, November. Yeah, um, A lot of Hindu, the religion and the festivals is devil worshipping. Some of the things they do, like one or two I've heard is like men and women go fully naked near the seashore and then they chant and apparently the devil's meant to come out. Allah knows best where the devil comes out, but that's their hope. And a lot of the Hindu religion, I've seen this is where a lot of black magic comes from, Hindu religion. So what I'm mentioning is that sometimes these times of the year, people get worse. Or it is a good idea, even Halloween, to keep your children indoors. Now some of you will get confused. That, Hang on, earlier you said Halloween's all baseless and it's pagan religions. Point. It is. It's not true in Islam. These dead people don't come alive, but shaitan is worshipped more. When shaitan is worshipped more, his jinns and he himself gets a bit stronger. Right? On the other hand, the Islamic festivals and days, Ramadan, Muharram, Arafat, big nights, people also feel their jinn, their jadu escalate. Why? 
We worship more. Shaitan is meant to be locked up in Ramadan. So why am I feeling more, worse? The answer to that is the first, the Ramadan one is, there's one hadith that all the shayateen are locked in, in the interpretation, and some ulama take the stance of the big one. Iblis is locked up, but his little cronies are still free. Yeah? So we say the little ones come and attack us, and we see people still missing salah, I'm not fasting in Ramadan, so who makes them do that? It's the little ones. So what happens is because the big one, and I always like to give an example of the sun. Think of Iblis like the sun. The main source of power and energy is gone. So like night, now, it's night time. The sun's gone. Iblis is locked up in Ramadan. So these little ones become less powerful. So how, but what they do, they don't give up. People who are possessed, people who have jinjad issue, they still attack, attack, attack. They try even harder. Why do they have to try harder? Because Muslims are fasting. Fasting is good protection from shaitan. Muslims are reading Quran. Quran is protection from shaitan. They're reading Taraweeh for hours and hours and hours. You do more ibadah. So we become stronger, they become weaker, hence they attack more. I'm saying this because not one, two, dozens of people have told me that their symptoms in Ramadan increase, escalate, and they live a lot, like ten times, tenfold. Even on days like Muharram, night of Muharram, Arafat day, definitely, because uh, shaitan is humiliated. It's a time of Hajj. Yeah, so I'll just mention that, that if you ever feel that, but on the opposite side, Christmas, New Year's, Halloween, Easter, pagan festivals, Hindu festivals, you know them dates, keep your adhkar off, keep your children inside. Number two, we will be able to see jinn in Jannah and they will not be able to see us. In Jannah you'll get whatever you want, so if somebody wants to see jinn, you can see jinn, you can see a lot of other things as well. Number three, is it true that fish or fish tanks invite jinns into the home? No, I've never heard that. I don't know about fish and fish tanks. Fish, like I said, the general rule is snakes and dogs are the common. Yeah, it's in Hadith, Hayyar and Kilab. Then, through experience, we can say a lot of cats. But that's not only them. Sometimes mice, rats, spiders, flies. It could be. So it could be even fish that Jinn has taken <coughs> possession of it. But it doesn't mean they invite them. Because I know loads of people. Anybody here with a fish tank? There you go, fish tank, yeah? You got a gin? <laughs> That's the answer from Muhammad Z. Okay. One other thing before we finish, inshallah, very quickly. I just remembered, is from the last program, I know we rushed the Q&A, and there were two, three common questions. I'm quickly going to go through them. Well, not quickly, because that was the complaint from last time, that I rushed through them. Because we didn't have time, there was Maghrib. But alhamdulillah, there's no salah now. So one of the questions was about evil eye. How do we protect ourselves? And if somebody's got nazar and evil eye, um, what's the cure for it? So the protection, first and foremost, I mentioned was stay off social media, stop advertising your everything, your burger, your chips, your cake, your gym, your holiday, your new handbag, shoes. You have to, if you really want to share it, share it with people you trust, family, friends, but don't put it out for the whole world to see. Because I mentioned evil eye comes from jinn and human. So for those people who think good of themselves and think everybody's my friend, it's <coughs> not, not necessarily. Number two, the ilaj for it is the morning, evening, adhkar, manzil. What's mentioned in the hadith is also there, I'll mention it again, that that when you are told to take a bath, then do it. What does that mean? Is just say, Harun here has done nazar on me and I know about it. He said, oh, you know what, sorry, you bought that new cardigan, I was jealous. But forgive me, so I said, you know what, that's causing me a lot of problems. I've got like spots all over my body or rash or skin, whatever problems. So this is the actual way. In the time of the Sahaba, people had clean hearts, pure hearts, this would happen. So we tell Harun to wash more or less all his body, arms, legs, heads, feet, etc. And then I would use that water to wash over myself. Yeah, this is what's mentioned in Hadith. When you're told to take a ghusl, do the ghusl. Till today, I don't know anybody who's done this because, like, who told me, yeah, he was jealous or she was jealous, so we did the ghusl. That's the first and foremost. That if you know somebody did tawbah and said, you know what, I've been jealous of you 10 years, you've got a big house, I live in a flat, you got a BMW, Mercedes, I've got a micro, this sort of stuff, and they've had it in for you, then that's the actual method. In times where we don't know, where hasad and jealousy is on the increase, then manzil, morning, evening du'as, like I said, pray on water, blow into it. And there's one last amal. 
um, which Alhamdulillah given to many people is Surah Safat and Surah Qalam. Yeah? Surah Safat in the 23rd para after Yasin and Surah Qalam in the 29th para. Yeah? Noon wal Qalam yuma yasturun. These surahs times seven, each one times seven, blow into water, bottle or jug and drink it. That's a cure for evil eye. That was one question. The second one was that came up two, three times was somebody has a partner, husband or wife, they're affected or you feel they're affected because of the symptoms, but they don't come for ilaj, they don't go to somebody for taweez or ruqya, etc. And they don't do anything. Either they don't pray namaz or they just pray namaz, no manzil bakara. What can you do because the other partner is suffering? So I mentioned briefly then was that you can do things yourself. So pray Surah Baqarah in the house. Yeah, it'll have an effect. Pray manzil and blow on his food or her food. And you don't need to tell them, basically. If they don't believe in it, you just carry on because you're suffering. Blow on water and you can give it to them. Um, them. If they don't come for like the common ilajis like taweez or ruqya, maybe take them for cupping because that can help as part of the ilaj. So just say, oh, we just go for sunnah. And other things are keep Quran, tilawah in the Quran. Again, recitation with the mouth. YouTube as well. Surah Baqarah. And in terms of other things, these are the forms of ilaj when somebody doesn't believe in it, but you know they're affected. And the last one was about authentic people. Yeah, how do you know somebody's authentic? So, um, obviously, the first and foremost thing is they should be following Quran and Sunnah. The person looks um, shari'i from the outside. So, like, you go to a guy and he's dressed in indecent clothing, and um, you go to a sister for ilaj and she doesn't wear hijab or she doesn't wear proper clothing, then that's against Sharia. That's not judgmental, by the way. Yeah? We live in this world where everything is judgmental. It's nothing to do with judgmental. From the outside, you can tell, oh, you know, this sister doesn't pray salah, this brother doesn't even come for Jummah. What well, ilaj is he going to do? Yeah, because you have to be doing these things yourself too. What did I say earlier? The more a person does, the stronger his recitation. And you notice this. Like I told you about the people who prayed Surah Fatiha once, boom, ilaj is done. Because the guy was praying probably tahajjud, probably fasting every day, giving a sadaqah. He was probably doing a lot of ibadat. His immune system was boosting. Yeah, and then you get people's immune system is dead. Yeah, sisters don't wear hijab, brothers don't pray salah. And how can they do ilaj? And people might laugh, but believe it or not, people are there who don't pray Jumma and Salah and they want to cure people. So one thing is according to Sharia. Number two, the methodology has to be according to Quran and Hadith. So I mentioned if it's Taweez, you should be able to read it. You should be able to know what it says. And number three, if they charge, obviously not haram to charge, they're charging a reasonable amount. If somebody's going into the hundreds, yeah, then that's common sense. Yeah, common sense plays a big part in our religion. So these are the things, inshallah. Hopefully that's answered everyone's questions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from any sort of evil, any wickedness, any form of jinn, evil jinns, jadu, black magic. And for those who are suffering, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant to you an authentic form of cure. Um, just to let you know, inshallah, there's a small publication of mine outside for sale. Inshallah, any brothers and sisters who would like to purchase it, feel free. Jazakallah khair.